Give our Lord Almighty a hand clap too as well. So if we could do that, let's give God a strong hand clap. And so we, we're on a series in James, as you know. We're uh, heading towards the, the, the final stretch and finishing it. Uh, and in James, uh, uh, James has convicted me in so many ways, and I pray that it has convicted you in so many ways as well, too. And so uh, in James, uh, the book is, is speaking about maturity and growth in God. Uh, James is adamant about the faith that we confess being the same faith that we live. And I pray that uh, wherever that gap may be, that God, through this sermon series, has been narrowing and bringing that gap closer so the what we believe is, is, is an outflow of how we act and how we live and how we talk. We talked about trials. Uh, we talked about temptations. We talked about the tongue. We talked about different things, about not only being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We talked about conflict like so many things of everyday Christian life that he has uh, laid out for us to understand. And so in that we are today, we're gonna be on, uh, we're gonna be finishing chapter four and starting chapter five. Uh, I kind of put two chapters together. Uh, and so we'll be able to finish uh, next week uh, in here. And so I'm really pumped about it. And so um, one thing is that, uh, well, today's message is called, what's your plan, right? Somebody say, what's your plan? And some of y'all are planners in this room, right? And some of us are not. Some of us plan not to plan. <laughs> um, I would like to think I'm a planner, but I really believe that my wife is really the planner. Uh, she'll be packing for a trip like a month before we go. I'm like, what are you doing? Where are you going? She's like, what do you mean where are we going? Where, where am I going? We're going on a trip next month. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. She starts early. She's a big-time planner. I'd like to think that I'm one, but uh, I don't think that I'm that much of a planner as she is. And so um, I planned to, this, is, this was my plan when we first got married on our anniversary, uh, to take her somewhere uh, away. It was just a local trip, a local getaway that I wanted to do something special, our first anniversary together. She had moved from Canada, so I just wanted to make it special. And so uh, I took her, uh, t so we drove out uh, and, and we stayed somewhere. I picked a hotel, it was a nice, it was older, but it was very beautiful, like a historic hotel. And so I knew that she would like that. And so we went there and we stayed the night there and uh, actually the first night there, I'm doing like, search, like Google searches of kind of things in the area that, that we can do. And I kept on seeing these news articles pop up. I'm like, okay, that can mean either two things, right? That can mean either the, the news companies are thrilled and about how amazing this hotel is or something else went down, right? And so something else went down, right? So, so I go in there and I click on it and I find out that there's numerous reports that this hotel was actually haunted, <laughs> yeah, it was a haunt, little, a real, not like a, it was a real life haunted hotel. And so with that, I realized immediately that my plans didn't go accordingly. And I don't know, again, if you're a planner and maybe you've planned things out and your plans didn't go accordingly, but uh, here James talks about plans and he breaks it down for us to understand it in a real life way. And so we're going to be reading from James chapter four. If we can all stand up for reading of God's word. We're going to be reading from James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. This is what James says. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or to that city, spend a year there, carry business, and make money. Why? Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is a Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is God's word and the church says, amen. amen. You may be seated. Few observations that I want to make here from this passage. Uh, the first is in James' writing is is a presumption of tomorrow, the presumption of tomorrow. 
um, verse, uh, as it, verse 13 opens up, it talks about a business person that's traveling in, 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 it's common for this time that they lived in for a business person to travel from place to place to place. And he's talking about uh, confidently talking about planning and profits and traveling from place to place, establishing contracts and doing things and, and making all these plans. Then and now, uh, this is a familiar language for a life of planning, right? We plan in our lives. There, the details may be different in our life versus what he's talking about here, but the mindset is the same. Uh, plans are part of life, right? Our plans are a part of our life. Whether you're a traveling merchant or a full-time employee or a business owner or a student, young or old, rich or not rich, wherever your situation is, we are all planners. Planning happens. The Bible commands it. The Bible commends planning, in fact. Yet in all the busyness and in all the planning, there's a danger that James warns us of, that we can adopt an attitude that is ungodly, that's arrogant, and even prideful. And so James is warning us that we can become so consumed with the material realm and all of our planning and thinking about plans and working and making money that we become blind to spiritual realities. So caught in the material realm forgetting the spiritual reality. So how do we avoid this? What do we need to consider in our lives to avoid what James is talking about here? Well, he breaks it down. First in verse 14, he says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And so James first tells us to view our view of tomorrow. What is your view of tomorrow? He's saying that your view of tomorrow is, it's a very uncomfortable truth that you don't know what your future holds. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what will happen. We like to think that we're in control. We like to think we know what will happen, but we don't. I don't. I got the car washed yesterday and it's typhoon outside. Like that was, that, I don't know what's happening. I, I don't know what's going on. We don't know what's happening. And we think that just because we plan something, there's a presumption that it'll happen. And we're reminded that life is uncertain by James. We don't know what'll happen. But do we factor that in our future? Do we factor that what we don't know, uh, that we don't know and we're not certain of what will happen in our future? The, the second is, is that he tells us to, ha- to view our lives the view of our lives, the view of tomorrow and the view of our lives. He says in verse 14, he continues to say, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Your life is a a mist that appears just for a moment and then vanishes. And true to James fashion, he doesn't pull any punches. He goes straight for the jugular and goes, hey, like this is what life is. And he compares it not to roses, not to, you know, this. He compares it to a mist. Right, And so I think he's doing that to grab your attention, to grab my attention so we can see visually and clearly what life is, is that we are a mist. We are just a blip on the screen of history and a blip on the screen of eternity. And we plan as if we're gonna live forever, don't we? We plan, we live as if we're gonna live to like a 180 or we, 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 we think we do. I mean, you think when, I think when I was 20, I thought I would live forever. And I'm like, I'm waiting, getting up out of the bed. I'm like, my back, like, maybe not. That might not be happening. <laughs> but but uh, he says that life is a, is a miss. It's just there. The, the, the conflict that we have, the, the issues that we have, the unforgiveness that we have, the, the planning that we make and the things that we invest our life in, the, the things that we spend our money on, all these things, it's just a uh, Mist is what James is saying. Now, how are you living in that mist? And so James transitions and gives us another perspective as well for us to consider in verse 15. He says, instead, everybody say instead. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. So my next observation is a posture of humility. A posture of humility, the presumption of tomorrow and the posture of humility. Verse 16, he talks about boasting and bragging and referring to all these things about doing it in your own strength. And we're gonna go here and we're gonna go there and we're gonna do this and we're gonna make money here. We're doing all these different things. We're gonna take this job and move to this city and buy this house and marry this person and get that car. And, 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 and have we brought any of that to God? Now that's a posture of humility. 
James is not against planning. Planning is good, but he's against planning that doesn't acknowledge God. Planning that does not acknowledge God. So what is a godly response? A godly response is to plan in a way that recognizes that we are ultimately not in control and we must surrender our plans to a sovereign God. We must surrender our plans to a sovereign God. Verse, uh, or Proverbs 16, verse nine says this. It says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The Lord establishes their steps. So when we, when we look at this, we're saying, okay, God is in control. He's leading our life and all of these things. And so what can happen very easily is that, that we can slide into a passive fatalism attitude that says, hey, if everything is determined, why should I do anything? I'm just gonna sit on the couch and God is gonna work his will out of my life. I'm just gonna sit around and that job is gonna come to me and that spouse is gonna knock on my door and come and say, it's me. It's like, what, what he, it's, he's not talking about this, just sitting back and this, this fatalism where God is just gonna do everything and you just sit around and you're unengaged in what God is doing in your life. James not saying that, of course, and in fact, he's given us a lot of direction in his book. He's saying, do this, don't do that. He's telling us a lot of stuff to do, not to sit around. But are we living in a posture of humility before God, dependence before him? Now, this is so radically different than what we hear in the world and what we see in the world and what culture says, that you must be self-made. You must blaze your own trail. It's about independence. It's about the individual. It's about me accomplishing my goal and me doing it and rolling up my sleeves and accomplishing it on my own. And people applaud you and give you awards and give you accolades for that. But that's not what James is saying. What James is saying is that, is there a humble dependence? Are we surrendering what we're doing to the will of God? Are we even inviting God into our plans or are we just asking him to bless it? And so we need a mindset that says, I need the grace of God and I am dependent on the will of God in every place of my life. I'm dependent on the grace of God and dependent on the will of God in every place of my life. And so this affects not only how, but this effect affects what? How and what? This affects how we think and also what we plan as well too. And by God's grace and mercy, you and I have lived to see another day. And we have uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we are not to use that time just as we please to use it. We're to use it in a way that honors God's desires. His desires are pure and they're good and they're noble. And so again, planning is not the problem. It's planning in a way that God has no place in your plans. Planning is it's kind of a tongue twister, right? <laughs> planning is not the problem, but it's planning in a way that God has no place in your plans. Again, where is God in your plans today? Where is he? Practically, on a practical level, are we consistent in our worship gathering? Are we making our spiritual life a part of our, of our life? Are we worshiping on Sundays? Are we coming together and fellowshipping with God's people? Uh, or are we just doing things and asking God to bless us? Are we spending time in prayer? Prayer is a measure of our humble dependence upon God. A, a prayer, a life that's lacking prayer is a, is a life that's lacking humility and dependence upon God. And, and are we spending time in scripture and, and, and allowing that to be a part of our life plan in worship? Are these things, does God have a part of our plans? And so in our plans, we're to surrender them to the will of God in a posture of humility, not living and planning like we are going to live forever, right? James said life is a mist. And so he helps us to put into perspective our plans and our priorities in life. Amen? Can I get amen? amen. All right. Uh, verse, or um, chapter five, we're gonna go into, um, don't worry, I won't make you stand up. All right, so uh, James chapter five, verse one through, we're gonna do one through five. And so it's kind of switching gears a little bit. 
uh, but it all works together. Remember, when the scriptures were originally written, they weren't rip, written with chapter and verses. We added that later so that we can find different things in the book. So this all read as one letter, right? And so this is what it says in James chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. I know this is so encouraging, right? <laughs> Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now that's a lot. Um, And so uh, we looked at a different area, presuming upon tomorrow, a posture of humility And now we're going to look at purposeless prosperity, purposeless prosperity. And so uh, this passage, we need to understand the context of it. It's, it's, It's not a general address to wealthy people. James doesn't have it after, he's not after the wealthy people, but he's, what he has in mind are wealthy unbelievers that are treating people a certain way, treating people unjustly. He's dealing with the injustice that's happening around the church and around the wealthy people around the city that's happening. And so how do we know that? How do we know that he's not talking to the believers or to the people in the church? Well, because his general address is to say brothers and sisters, right? We saw that. He says brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. He's talking about his church family. He doesn't refer to them as his brothers and sisters. And he also doesn't have them, uh, he's also not uh, telling them to turn away from their sin. He's just saying, this is where you're at. And so he's not speaking to the believer. He's speaking to the wealthy unbeliever that's living in a type of way that's dishonoring people. And so what's James' purpose? James' purpose in this is not to teach the ungodly, rich people of their wrongdoings. He's not out to tell people, hey, he's not out to tell the rich people, hey, you're doing wrong. He's not doing that, but he's, or he's not primarily doing that. He's communicating to the readers who are a part of this church, who are experiencing the injustice at this time of what God thinks about their behavior. It's almost like uh, he's allowing the people, the readers to put their ear against the door and hear what God not only would say, but listen, but God, what God will say. Not only what he would say, but he is going to say this to individuals that are living in this way in, in regards to resources and finances and money. And so I have to say this here is that wealth is not the issue. That's not what James is after. Wealth, it is not the issue, but it is what is done with the wealth that's the issue. And it's especially the treatment of people that with the wealth that's done. That's what he's after. And so although he's speaking to these wealthy, rich unbelievers, there is a lot that we can learn from this area. There's a lot that we can learn from what James is saying as we're overhearing what he's saying to them. And now before we let ourselves off the hook, I got a a pretty uh, interesting fact. According to the United Nations, this is what it says. One billion, with a B, one billion people worldwide live on less than one dollar a day. The threshold defined by the international community as constituting extreme poverty. Before you say, hey, I'm no Jeff Bezos, I'm no Elon Musk, I don't got that, this is not including me. Listen, on the world standards, you are pretty wealthy. You have clothes on your back, you have several pieces of clothes in the closet, some probably more than you should, right? Uh, uh, You have a roof over your head, you open the fridge, there's food in there. Uh, You've got shoes on your feet, uh, you've got maybe a little bit of money in the bank. You've, you've come here on a car with, with gas in it or maybe the battery's filled up, whatever you're you know, driving. It's like, hey, like uh, we are pretty wealthy compared to the world standards. And so let's look at it in perspective of that. Can we do that? Uh, he says this, listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming. 
And now he explains why judgment is coming to them. Uh, uh, it's true, true like Old Testament fashion uh, that James is speaking to them. He says in verse two, uh, wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify you against, the, your, uh, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. So the first aspect that James is talking about is, is he's talking about hoarding. Hoarding, immediately what goes to mind is the show Hoarders, right? Where they have all this stuff in their house and they have people with cameras and come and like, well, that is weird. Like, I mean, well, I don't know if you're a hoarder, why you would want people to come and see what you got unless, you, you know, whatever. But like, so they're, they're hoarding, right? And so these wealthy people are hoarding. And what is this? It's a picture of massive waste, of lavish possessions, of having things just for the sake of having things. And it's a picture of rotting food. Think of a, a spread of food out more than what you need, but it's so much out there that you can afford it, but you don't care and it's rotting away. And he says, your clothes, you've got so much of it, it's being eaten by moth and your jewelry is being corroded. Uh, he says silver and gold. And, and it's interesting, right? Because is J James just ignorant and he doesn't know that gold doesn't corrode? What's his deal? But I think he might be saying something else. I think he might be saying, even that which is sure is not sure. Even that which doesn't corrode at some point will corrode. Your silver and your gold. We live in a materialistic world where more stuff means success. The more you accumulate, the more you have, the more successful you are. Look at how many houses he has. Look at how many cars he has. Look at how many this, how many. We, we try to accumulate. And, and the more we accumulate, the more people say that person is successful. We find identity. We find our strength. We find our comfort in the things that we're able to hoard in our lives. However, these things just like us, are fleeting. They are just a mist, all passing away. I remember I had a, like years ago, I don't remember how long ago this was, I, I was having some issues with a car that I was driving at the time. I think it was a radiator issue or something. And uh, uh, it, was for, uh, a, uh, it, it was for a foreign car. And so I went to the mechanic and I said, hey, look, I need to get this thing fixed. He said, okay, this is what it is. The radiator's busted, this, this, that, and that, and that. And he said, this is how much it is. I said, I don't have, I don't have the money. Well, he says, well, you don't have the repairs. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, what, what are my options? He said, okay, well, you can either buy the part or you can go to a junkyard and, and get the part from there. I was like, junkyard? Oh, I, I didn't need, that's a pretty smart idea. So I thought it was a great idea. I called the junkyard. I show up and it is a massive junkyard. It is car, rows and rows and rows of cars. And he's like, go find the car. I'm like, what? Like, how, there's like a million cars out here. He's like, yeah, yeah, go find the car. I'm looking around. There's all these cars, boats, jet skis, all these things. I'm looking around. All the stuff, all of it is just dilapidated. It's rusted out. It can't be used. I mean, that, like there's nothing salvageable here. But it hit me. It's like, man, how many people have given up their families for that stuff? How many people have, uh, have given up their lives for that stuff? How many people have, ha have just forfeited uh, the, their families and, and all these things in a pursuit for that? The stuff that just rusts and is just gone after, it's here one day, gone. The cars that we drive here today, they're not gonna be around 40, 50 years from now. They're not gonna be around unless you drive an 85 Stingray, but you know, that'll last. You can look that up later. So he's not saying to Christians, it's wrong to save for the future, to, to, to uh, contribute to retirement. That is not what he's saying. In fact, uh, the, the, scriptural, the scriptures commend people that are prudent, that are good, that are good with saving. But we need to think about the way that such things are done. It's important to consider these things. Have these things been the pursuit of our lives? Is our, whole li is our decision making based upon that? Uh, is, is the decisions that we make in our lives based upon how much money we can make? Or is it surrendering it to the will of God and saying, God, where, you, where do you want me to go? Or is it to the neighborhood that we like the best? Or is it saying, God, I, I surrender uh, my will to, to, to where you want me to live? There might be a family, might be a neighborhood that might be touched as a result of that. Last in verse four, he says, look, the wages you fail to pay the workers 
who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. The other element of this is taking advantages of others. Uh, God goes head on with dealing with injustice. He deals with the injustice that's happening. He doesn't turn a blind eye and act like it doesn't happen. He comes right forward and says, hey, there's injustice happening and it needs to be dealt with. And it actually says the Lord Almighty talking about the Lord of hosts. It's talking about the Lord, uh, the, the, the Lord, the leader of heaven's armies is what it's saying. And so there are some landowners in this time that were uh, taking uh, advantage of the people there and they were delaying payments. They were not paying them on time. And, and so uh, this was difficult because a lot of them worked day by day. And so when you didn't pay them for a day, they didn't eat that day. And so he's dealing with that. And so how, how, what principle can we take from this is that in an effort to get what you want, are you taking advantage of others? In an effort to get what you want, are you taking advantage of others? your gain for other people's pain. So he's dealing with this head on. The last part here is in verse five, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. And so he talks about luxury and self-indulgence. He's coming for everybody, I'm sorry. Y'all so serious today? So maybe you're just focused. I like to think that. James is not saying don't enjoy nice things. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking about you enjoying and, and having nice things. No, God wants you to enjoy those things to the glory of God. But it's talking about you being the center of everything. Uh, the goal of your life is to pamper yourself as much as you pop possibly can, as much as you can afford or even not afford. Where, where your, your life's objective is how can I most comfortably pamper myself to live in as much luxury as I can possibly afford? Money's not bad. It's a love of money. Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. Why does he compare God and money? Because when you serve God, you surrender your will to God. God leads your life. God influences your life. In the same way, when we yield our life to money, money can lead our life. Money can be the decision maker of our life. And money can, uh, can influence in our, our life in the same way that God does. You can't love both God and money. And, and part of that, that, that produces that is this uh, self-indulgent kind of luxury. How, how luxurious can I afford to live? The prophet Dave Ramsey says this. <laughs> we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Should I say it again? We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. So we have our time, our talent, and our treasure, not for ourselves. It's not for yourself. Life is not all about you. It's not about you. It's about living in such a way that you're influencing and impacting other people's life by the grace in God. The same mercy and grace that touched you, you wanna see it touch other people as well too. Your wealth and your resources are to be used purposefully not extravagantly. Uh, in, in, in such a good fashion, we've been looking at how uh, uh, James echoes the teachings of Jesus, right? We, we've done that like every week so far. We, we've looked at how Jesus' teachings is echoed by James. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 9 and 20. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin, I don't know what a vermin is, it sounds disgusting though, destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. He's encouraging us to, to live a life where we're not storing up this junk that just fades away, but investing into something that is beyond us into eternity, laying up treasures because our life here is just a mist. I think about how our church is making such an impact. We've had an amazing food distribution that's been going on for years. What started as a temporary thing has been going on for years. We've seen thousands of people receive food. We, we've seen them receive prayer. We've seen them receive encouragement. We've, we've seen them know that God knows them and that God loves them through this church. Amen. 
We've seen Uganda, we've seen Pakistan, we've seen Colombia, we've seen all these places, countries you may have never even been, people you may have never even meet, being impacted in such a way where they're learning about the love of God over their life. See, friends, we are investing in eternity, something bigger and beyond us. It's not all about us. And that's what a generous life does. It, it removes that, we're all born with it, that self-centered, like, uh, like that part of us that just wants everything for ourselves. God says the way to remove that is by living this generous life where it's not all about how we can pamper and live the best, most comfortable life that we can live, but living in a way that we make an eternal impact and our life actually makes a difference. Amen? So I want us to all stand up if we could. As we bring things together, I want to bring things together. Maybe today... Um, you need to surrender your plans to God. I know, it could be scary, but trust me, there's no one that's a better planner than him. I know what I can do when I plan my own life. It's not good. He's infinitely wise and infinitely loving and knows what's best for you. Sometimes we don't see it in the immediate, but when we pan out, he has the full picture I thank God for the doors that he's closed in my life. In the moment, it didn't feel good. It hurt. There was resent, uh, all these things. But I'm so glad that he closed those doors because when he closes one door, he opens another. Maybe you need to surrender your plans to God if you're honest. Maybe you've made all these plans and things for yourself and you didn't even consider God. And now you're praying for God to answer the things that he didn't even have any say in. Maybe it's time to bring that before him. So I wanna leave you with two questions. One is, where is God in the plans you have for your life? Where's God in the plans you have for your life? And where is God in your finances? Where's God in your finances? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your presence, for your love. We thank you for leading the way and knowing the way. God, we don't know the way. We often don't know where we're going, but we like to think that we do. You know the way. And we thank you that you not only know the way, but you'll show us the way. We surrender our plans to you those things that we have come up with, the, the, the things that we have desired and wished and hoped for, Lord, we just present it to you knowing that you know best. Lord, we offer our resources, our finances to you saying, Lord, it's yours. It's yours to begin with. It's never ours. But may we do something that makes an eternal impact and difference with what we have. Speaking of plans, God has a plan he had a plan to forgive us of our sins, to give us a new life, a new hope, a new purpose, a new plan. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, friend, God has a plan for your life. You don't have to wonder and what will God do and uh, life is up to you and, and you gotta figure it out on your own. That's not the case. God has a plan for you, friend. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I wanna give you that opportunity. I'm just gonna count from three to one. If that's you, I'm just gonna ask you to just raise your hand. Three, two, one. If that's you, just raise your hand and I'm gonna pray for you.